morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this morning's or this evening's uh, online academic lecture series from Worcester College here in Oxford. Many of you will know that this evening's lecture is part of a wider series of events supporting the college's new uh, initiative of annual interdisciplinary research themes. And this year, as you will have anticipated, the theme is sustainability. As well as aiming to increase biodiversity on the college estate and to reduce our carbon emissions, the college is committed to widening and deepening our research on sustainability. And we do that by using our unique college environment to facilitate interdisciplinary research, the estate that uh, all of you will know and love. And our goal is to establish clusters of students and junior researchers across a variety of disciplines by funding graduate scholarships and early career opportunities so that people can work together and with our focus on this theme to solve our sustainability problems, which I know most of you will agree are hugely pressing. You will also know that the college runs a distinguished visiting fellow program to invite distinguished academics to college. And this term, we're delighted that Dr. Tundi Agadi is working and living in college and meeting students and academic staff to contribute to the important theme of sustainability and our sustainability season. For those of you who don't know uh, Tundi's work, she's an internationally renowned expert in marine conservation. She leads Sand Seas, which she founded, which is an independent multidisciplinary group based in Washington, DC. And through this initiative, Tundi works at the nexus of science and policy to promote environmental problem solving with partners from around the whole world. This includes think tanks, foundations, development banks, academic institutions, environmental groups, development banks and academic institutions, as well as uh, environmental uh, groups on the ground. But especially she works with individual nations struggling to implement sound marine management. Dr. Agadi was born in the US after her parents and sister fled Hungary in the 1950s. She studied at Wellesley and Dartmouth Colleges in New England, and then went on to lead an endangered species management program in the US Virgin Islands, a place where she first became inspired to work in ocean conservation. And that was on a high school uh, field trip, I understand. Returning to graduate school at the University of Rhode Island, she researched fisheries management and sea turtle population dynamics, and that led to a Master of Marine Affairs and a PhD in Biological Sciences. Tundi was part of a nascent coastal resources centre which shared American expertise in coastal planning with developing countries, and this in addition to her work as a Marine Policy Fellow working with multilateral institutions, including UNESCO, uh, sowed the seeds for interdisciplinary uh, work as a senior scientist in the World Wildlife Fund. With no formal Marine programme, when she joined in 1990, Tundi worked with nations across the globe to assist in priority setting and project design. And in 1998, she was awarded the Civic Scientist of the Year Award by the Earthwatch Foundation. In 2005, Dr. Agardi headed the coastal portion of the first global evaluation of the status of ecosystems in relation to human well-being. And the following year, she was awarded the University of Miami's Rosenstiel Award for significant achievement in oceanography and marine policy. And following those uh, distinguished achievements for more than two decades, she has led Sound Seas, 
finding ways to interface between the scientific community, the international policy arena, NGOs and other interested parties to set policy frameworks for effective and sustainable marine conservation. Quite an achievement over many, many years. And Tundi, we're delighted to have you at Worcester College. And it's an honor to listen to your presentation this evening. I'm sure you will, will agree this is a wonderful opportunity to hear more about sustainability and the discussions that we're curating here at Worcester. Tony's going to speak for about 40 minutes. There will then be an opportunity for questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A box um, on your screens, and then I will do my best to uh, raise the questions on a fair basis and allow uh, Tundi the opportunity to answer them. So thank you for joining. Welcome, uh, Tundi. And now over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And thank you for the opportunity to come as a visiting fellow uh, to Worcester College. It's been fantastic. I am just reveling in the um, in the great work that is being done across disciplines here and the fact that you've developed a sustainability strategy and um, I'm really enjoying the work that I'm doing with Dr. Lisa Wedding, who um, is working in um, the Department of Geography uh, running the Seascapes Lab. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I can do that. And I'm assuming that you can see that. I hope you can. Uh, I think I'll get a message if I can if you can't see it. Uh, my ambition today is to talk about ocean sustainability and to talk about the pathway that we're currently on uh, and the pathways that we need to be on um, in the future. So as many of my colleagues that travel the world and work to solve problems um, across the globe, there's good news and there's bad news. Um, I won't uh, spend too much time on the bad news, but I do want to begin with the bad news to kind of set the stage. Uh, we're currently in a situation where we have a kind of negative feedback loop uh, with coastal and marine degradation going on. That habitat loss is driving uh, the loss of resources and values that people depend on. That's creating more and more conflict. And in turn, that's leading to more and more degradation of nature um, and loss of um, the values that and benefits that nature provides. It's a, a bit ironic because as our knowledge about ocean values grows, uh, those values are being lost. And we have amassed an enormous body of knowledge, both experiential knowledge, uh, uh, scientific knowledge, user knowledge, indigenous knowledge. We now are quite wise about what's going on with the ocean. Uh, and we're also very aware of our impact on oceans uh, and the values that they provide us. But unfortunately, we seem to be stuck in this destructive kind of feedback loop, uh, an endless cycle on a path that we need to be getting off of. Uh, this knowledge about values um, runs the gamut from everything from understanding carbon sequestration of the oceans, so the role of the oceans um, in mitigating climate change um, and also in promoting adaptation to climate change. That's been a focus for many, many researchers, um, especially in the last decade. But also we've un understood that certain portions of the coasts and ocean uh, deliver certain kinds of values that are extremely important to certain groups of people. Uh, and we've been able to quantify those values. We've been able to study trends in, in those values and uh, in the benefits that flow. In fact, the Millennium Assessment um, that David mentioned uh, was the first to look at uh, global ecosystems across the board, everything from urban ecosystems to ocean ecosystems. And what the findings of that uh, assessment showed was that the coastal areas really 
have uh, an enormous myriad of ecosystem services or benefits that nature provides. Uh, different, um, different beneficiaries benefit from those values or ecosystem services, but uh, it is one of the most rich um, biomes in the world in, in terms of delivery of values um, important to humans. Uh, these ecosystem services have been quantified many times, and uh, there's a lot of debate about the, the absolute number, but certainly in the tens of trillions of dollars um, of value provided to human beings. But I think more importantly, rather than just focusing on the monetary value of the benefits that nature provides, to think about a healthy ocean as being the foundation for life on Earth. And without a healthy ocean, life cannot persist on the planet. So it is that important, much more important than the individual values um, that certain beneficiaries derive from the ocean. We utilize the ocean in many, many ways, and that utilization causes both direct pressures and also uh, indirect impacts. Um, the indirect impacts can come from far away from the ocean. And unfortunately, the oceans are um, the ultimate sink for a lot of the pollutants um, that we've created in the world. Uh, and they uh, are affected again, not only by what we do in, in the sea and on the coast, but also what we do in river systems and in land areas, sometimes very far from the coast. Against the backdrop of all these cumulative multiple pressures, we have climate change. And along with climate change comes uh, ocean warming, which is really stressing a lot of um, ecosystems and their ability to deliver services. We have ocean acidification, which is a special category of climate change impact, uh, very troubling one, one that we're only now uh, coming to understand and only now appreciating the, the ramifications of um, increasing acidification on uh, marine life and then ultimately on human life. Uh, we have also, of course, sea level rise and the loss of coastal habitats, um, increased storm events, and um, along with that, an inundation of a lot of areas, which then causes a lot of pollution of coastal areas as waters recede and so forth. So we have a lot of problems to solve. The current condition is one in which uh, we've had loss of habitat. I won't regale you with the figures, it's quite depressing, but for certain ecosystems like coral reefs, we've lost a very high percentage of coral reefs and there is reason to believe that coral reefs will disappear unless we change our trajectory. We also have a lot of pollution problems and these seem to be kind of under the radar. Uh, we have a lot of toxins um, coming into the ocean environment. As I said, the ocean is a sink for all of what we do uh, and land and freshwater uh, and in the sea. And a specific problem with pollution in the marine environment, which is getting attention, but probably not as much attention as it should get is eutrophication or um, the over fertilization of coastal waters, which is leading to um, a declines in productivity and sometimes um, dead zones that spread across very wide areas um, and cause the complete loss of um, ecosystem services and benefits to mankind. We also have a problem that we're squeezing people who are dependent on oceans into smaller and smaller spaces with fewer and fewer resources. And that of course causes a lot of conflict. Now you might think uh, the, the world is a very big place and the global ocean is a very, very vast system. And that is true. But unfortunately, the coastal areas are not so vast. They're a very thin band uh, of um, transitional um, ecosystem between the land and the sea uh, and across fresh water. 
And the coastal systems are actually not only the systems that are under the most pressure from humankind, but also the systems that are kind of containing what I would call the vital organs of the ocean system itself. So these are the most ecologically important areas, the transition areas between land and sea mediated by fresh water. So things like estuaries, um, shorelines uh, themselves, um, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, um, delta areas, and so forth. These are the areas that are keeping the ocean system alive and healthy and running well. And these are paradoxically the areas that we are most impacting by both direct and indirect use. Now, the values in coastal ecosystems really explain a lot of historical human settlement. Um, we, we have in coastal systems, these pull factors, these reasons that people choose to settle in coastal areas, particularly around um, estuaries. So uh, we have a current situation where about a little over a third of the global population lives in the coastal area. It does vary about how you define coastal zones so that you'll see figures like one half, one third, but in any case, a significant amount of the human population lives on the coast. And about two thirds of that coastal population lives close to a major estuary within 50 kilometers. And the reason for that is that major estuaries uh, provide a lot of services. They provide um, access to the sea for transport. Uh, they provide waste management. They provide uh, water um, balancing or hydrological balance. They provide a lot of resources that humans rely on, both food and material. Uh, and for this reason, people have chosen to settle on the coast near these estuaries, which again are the vital organs of the system. So we have a situation which is uh, difficult, but it is a wicked problem that we know how to solve. And that's the good news. We know what the pathways are that lead to ocean sustainability. We do know that. We do have the tools and the technology to go down these pathways. We have also a collective understanding that things need to change. So I think this point can't be emphasized enough. I think 20 or 30 years ago, um, in the dawn of the environmentalism era, there was very little attention to oceans. And there was a sense that oceans were too big to fail that there were, was nothing that humans could do that would ever alter uh, ocean ecology or um, impact ocean productivity and the delivery of these um, ecosystem services. But we now know better and we now have publics around the world who are understanding that oceans are declining in health and that we need to do something about it that that's imperative not only for marine life, but also for human life. And I think the really, really good news and the reason that I um, tend to be an optimist, even though I traffic in uh, data about declines, <laughs> is that I think we are in an extremely opportune time right now, probably the most opportune time to affect change. And even though the clock is ticking and the change is ur urgently needed, we have the ability to seize these opportunities right now. So let me explain why I think there is hope um, for trying to find these pathways and why I feel the enabling conditions just happen to be right at this current point in time. There are a number of international treaties that have come into being in the past two years. Um, really exciting time for seeing the world converge on this um, need to conserve biodiversity, um, to restore the ecosystems that we've degraded, um, and to bring new focus on marine areas. Um, so I'll run down this list quickly and then uh, describe a little bit um, these agreements in more detail. So we have the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, and an agreement that was um, 
signed or agreed, I should say, in late 2022, uh, which committed the many member states to a global biodiversity framework uh, to achieve actually a number of uh, targets. And I'll describe those in a little bit. Uh, in addition, there was a very exciting agreement uh, in the United Nations uh, recently, which is concerning the high seas or the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and this was a landmark agreement years in the making uh, and has a lot of uh, promise for trying to manage our impacts on the high seas. Uh, we have had recently in the um, U European Union, a restoration law that went into effect, uh, which is a binding law and which I'll describe in a little bit too, which has implications for not just land, but also sea. Uh, we have a couple of, we're in the middle of actually a couple of UN decades, uh, the UN uh, decade for ocean science and the UN decade of restoration. Uh, we've had some very interesting negotiations in the World Trade Organization around uh, perverse subsidies and how to um, get rid of some of those. And then in addition, there have been high profile reports that have been picked up by the media uh, and have been really not just galvanizing attention and focusing on kind of priorities, but also providing guidance um, in how to address some of these high profile issues. So I'll go into these in a little bit more detail now. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, as I said, it was agreed in late December of 2022, uh, coming out with a global biodiversity framework uh, for the member states, uh, which are virtually all the, the countries in the world. Uh, the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, has 23 targets. Uh, they're very, very ambitious targets. And uh, they are much more... Um, complex and detailed than earlier decadal targets that the CBD has agreed. So um, the last targets that were stipulated or agreed were in 2020. They were called the Aichi targets. And in the Aichi targets, the countries agreed to protect the biodiversity in 20% of land and sea area by the year 2020. Now that target was missed, um, it was not achieved. Um, and the new targets in the global biodiversity framework are actually even more ambitious. Uh, the targets surrounding the coverage of the protected areas to conserve biodiversity, for instance, is 30% of land and sea area to be protected by 2030. Now it might, strike you as odd as to say that uh, we didn't achieve the target in 2020, therefore we're going to up the target in 2030. But in fact, the 2030 targets are much more um, specific in what needs to be done uh, and provide much more guidance on how these targets can be achieved. Um, so I think a great improvement over the 2020 targets and the 2010 targets that preceded those. So I won't go into too much detail uh, for the purposes of ocean restoration um, and these pathways to sustainability. It's really target two, um, which stipulates that 30% of land and sea area should be under restoration by the year 2030. And then target three, which is this global coverage of protected areas, uh, which aims for 30% land and 30% sea. Uh, to be protected by 2030. Uh, lots of other targets to uh, uh, concerning sustainable use, and many of these play into the ability to protect and restore. Uh, the High Seas Agreement, or the BB&J Agreement, it's called BB&J because it's uh, referred to as the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Agreement. Um, and this is a new agreement under the existing UNCLOS or UN Law of the Sea Agreement, uh, a binding treaty, um, which again involves most countries of the world. Uh, the United States is not among them, but uh, most other maritime nations uh, do 
have ratified the law, the C convention. So the BB&J agreement is very, very significant. And the reason is that the high seas, the areas beyond each country's jurisdiction, actually cover um, a very large part of the earth, about 40% of their surface. Everything that you see in this map in blue is high seas or A, B, and J, areas beyond national jurisdiction. So a huge part of the planetary system is basically uh, a wild west, a, a place uh, that is not being controlled by any nation or group of nations. Um, and that kind of lack of control and lack of um, stewardship for nature in these places um, has led to this uh, new landmark agreement. Uh, the BB&J agreement sets out some very specific things and um, it does so in a very strategic way. So one is this uh, requirement to establish large-scale marine protected areas in the high seas. And this, of course, um, touches back on the CBD agreement and helps fulfill that target of 30% by 2030. Uh, but in addition to that, so it's not just about uh, setting up marine protected areas, um, and it's not just about uh, the negotiations that would go into that. You can imagine uh, the global community trying to come up with priorities on where to site these protected areas um, and uh, what kind of regulations should take place in them. It goes beyond just protected areas, so it talks, uh, speaks a lot to the sharing of benefits um, that come from um, exploiting marine resources on the high seas, um, and stipulates that there must be very strong um, uh, assessments done, environmental impact assessments done, whenever um, any extractive industry um, is going to take place uh, in a pla in on the high seas. Uh, and this is a reaction to um, uh, voluntary or soft um, treaties, uh, non-binding treaties or voluntary things like the FAO conduct on fisheries, um, which um, don't have this kind of clear uh, regulatory um, oversight to make sure that we can anticipate impacts before the activities take place. Um, and that can weigh into the trade-offs and, and choices made by the international community about whether or not to allow certain activities to take place. Um, the BB&J agreement also focuses very much on capacity building, recognizing that the high seas are only accessible to those nations that have um, a strong uh, research or industrial uh, fleet, essentially, and um, can access these distant waters. Um, and also that a lot of the information about the resources uh, and uh, their potential value it, um, is currently held in um, the developed world. And so there's um, stipulations on transfer of data um, and um, technological transfer as well. Um, so that there'll be more equitable sharing of benefits on the high seas, which are, after all, a global common. Uh, the EU restoration law, I won't go into that too much, but it, it really bears mentioning because it is legally binding on every country within the European Union uh, to establish uh, restoration programs, uh, which require then to understand why why these areas that are degraded uh, became degraded um, and take steps towards both active um, and passive restoration to help them recover. So this is of course very pertinent to all of the EU countries which are scrambling to develop these uh, restoration programs and put them in place um, as, as the EU restoration law target looms. Uh, but it's also going to be really important for a lot of the rest of the world who will be watching to the EU countries to see how they actually instituted restoration uh, and um, to see what, what led to successes and what might have tripped up um, restoration projects um, uh, and from which we can learn. 
Um, I, the UN decades, um, I only mention these, you know, every decade is a UN decade of something or several things, actually. Um, just so happens that uh, we happen to be in a UN, a set of UN decades that's really pertinent for ocean restoration. And one, again, is this um, UN decade of ocean science, uh, which has very strong commitments to share ocean science very widely, to collect data and make it available um, to the global community, um, but also again, to, to transfer technology um, and to build, therefore build the capacity um, of countries that are um, underdeveloped in the, in the marine science domain. Um, but importantly also, and especially for the purposes of planning for restoration, the UN uh, Ocean Decade also uh, commits to mapping marine biodiversity uh, very widely across the ocean basin. And that's going to be very important as decisions are made of uh, about access and allocation of resources, um, both on the high seas and of course, within the jurisdiction of countries. Um, the other reason that I mentioned these two decades is because even though they're kind of aspirational and um, they aren't, they don't carry the same heft as a binding international treaty, uh, they are really important for a number of reasons. One is that they focus the attention on priorities that are collectively decided by the global community. Uh, and the priorities for oceans and seas um, include among them this reducing pollution as a top priority, something that a lot of the other treaties don't dare touch. Um, very difficult to reduce pollution because pollution of the ocean comes from far upland, uh, from our freshwater systems, uh, from groundwater sometimes, um, not just also from what we do at sea. So. Uh, reducing pollution is a, a big ambition of the ocean decades, and the sharing of information, of experience, and of technology uh, will help us achieve that goal. Um, all, related to that is uh, a commitment in the um, decade of restoration, um, and actually supported by the UN o o decade on ocean science, is to reduce hypoxia or low oxygen levels. You may have heard of dead zones in the ocean. These are areas that um, become robbed of oxygen, uh, which causes a die off of um, certain organisms um, and can often lead to uh, a complete, what we call a dead zone, an area with little life in it. Uh, and these uh, hypoxic and anoxic areas around the world are growing. Uh, some of them are quite large, uh, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, in North America, or in um, the Black Sea. These areas are growing both um, in their breadth and also in, um, in their depth layer. So they're getting deeper and deeper or um, more and more volume covered by these low oxygen areas. So hugely important issue and one that the international community is now committed to resolving. Um, and of course, the UN decade, uh, ocean decade, um, also focuses on sustainable harvest and sustainable use and what can be done on the coast to protect uh, land uh, and infrastructure from flooding and um, storm impacts. I mentioned the high profile reports and I won't go into these in any detail. Um, just to say, um, if you, these are just ones that come to mind um, kind of spontaneously. Um, there are many, many important reports that have come out, including the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which published a report on oceans and cryosphere. Um, and the work of the uh, International Panel on um, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. These reports are huge synthetic um, amalgamation of our knowledge um, and our science around uh, climate change, around oceans, around nature and uh, ecosystem services. And um, many of these reports have attracted the attention of uh, mass media. 
And for that reason, uh, it's attracted the attention of the global citizenry, um, who then in turn put pressure on politicians to um, address these problems um, in a way. Now, one thing you might notice from this list of high profile reports that, I, as I say, are very um, ad hoc, just came spr sprung to mind to, for me, uh, is that all of these touch on the economic value of the ocean, um, both in terms of resources and in terms of um, ecosystem services and, and cultural values. Um, it is really this um, sophistication that we now have in valuation that's attracted a lot of attention to these issues that wasn't there before. Um, and it, it, it does appear that this also is attracting the attention of, of policymakers and decision makers um, who uh, do pay attention when there's talk of uh, resources that are wasted or um, economic opportunities that occur uh, when we restore these systems. Just a quick note on the World Trade Organization harmful subsidies negotiations. So um, this has been in play for a long time. Environmental groups have been putting pressure on the World Trade Organization to tackle this subject, um, both in terms of agricultural subsidies, but also in terms of um, fishery subsidies, and particularly um, subsidies uh, providing fuel to industrial um, fishing operations. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure because um, there isn't much traction that environmental groups can put on individ individual industries um, or individual countries um, to do this. So there is a sense that um, by taking this up in the World Trade Organization, it elevates the, the issue uh, and could lead to uh, international agreement. And in fact, it did lead to an international agreement. So in 2022, a, a very uh, good year for international agreements, uh, there was an agreement in the World Trade Organization to phase out harmful fuel subsidies. Um, I think this is a great first step. Um, it's not actually operational yet because two thirds of the member states have to um, accept it or deposit instruments of acceptance. And we're only about halfway there right now. Um, but there's more work to be done at the WTO. And as we speak, the WTO is negotiating um, how to take these um, steps to control harmful subsidies even further. Um, and to, especially on the fishery side, to really look at cap capacity enhancing subsidies. So, um, subsidies which allow overcapitalization of fishing fleets, uh, which then drives overexploitation, which is very difficult to control and stop. So uh, keep an eye on this space because this uh, negotiation is playing out right now and we'll see uh, what comes of it. And we'll see if 2024 is also a good year for international agreements. So of course, these are all good aspirations. But you might ask, how can we actually make these aspirations into a reality? And I would say to that, that um, aspirations are all fine and good, but we need to move in the direction that we aspire to. to. And at each step that we take, we make a choice. And the world community and political leaders have the decision to stay on the track that we're on, which is largely leading to overexploitation and degradation, or they have the choice to change track, to find a new path, to think about um, what would benefit the greatest amount of people and what would satisfy human well being, while at the same time, of course, allowing nature to restore itself because the health of nature, including the ocean, is fundamental to our human well-being. So there are other paths that we're on, and I'm just gonna mention a few that I think are concrete, tangible pathways to get us to ocean restoration and to sustainability. So the first one is just taking stock of what we already know uh, and using that information 
to scope out the problems that are in front of us to be able to craft solutions. So um, while there is an enormous investment in um, academic institutions like Oxford and others to build up the body of knowledge, we have to apply this knowledge in, first of all, in understanding these problems very specifically, and then crafting solutions to address these specific problems. So why do I think, and you may think, well, that's obvious, <laughs> but in fact, um, in the marine domain, especially, at least this is what I'm familiar with. I don't know if the same exists in the, in the terrestrial sphere, but in the marine domain, what we have often is a situation where people who are making decisions, planners or managers, uh, resource managers, often reach for a solution before they even understand what the problem is. Uh, and the problem scoping step seems to be a step that um, people like to jump over <laughs> and or give a small amount of time and energy to. So I think now we have so much knowledge, we have so much experience, we have this knowledge integrated now and we have it shared across countries and across regions. So I think we're now able, we're at the point where we're now able to use our, our information, our experience, our knowledge to be able to scope these problems well. Each case will be different. Each site will be different. Each ocean basin or sea is different. Uh, but we do have the knowledge about most places to understand what the problem is and to be able to craft a solution. And I also want to say here that uh, we shouldn't think that this is scientific information that we derive um, in kind of traditionalist ways, um, in traditional conventional science ways, uh, but it's also information, very importantly, social science information, so not just natural science, but also user knowledge and traditional knowledge. So what people know and understand about the places where they work and live um, and bringing that local knowledge or user knowledge or traditional knowledge into the greater mix of, of knowledge is really um, a good way to be able to scope these problems and craft solutions. Um, now, I love donkeys, but I do want to <laughs> uh, put out a, a warning for um, asses. And by asses, um, this is um, alternative stable states. Uh, it's something that uh, has cropped up um, in many mar marine systems. Alternative state, stable states are something that we desperately need to avoid. Um, they're very difficult to fix once a critical threshold has been passed. Um, and an example of this is, um, this is the simplest example that I know is coral reef systems. Corals are um, general, uh, corals are animals. They live uh, in colonial um, assemblages um, on, and they make reef structures. So coral reef is uh, a, a community of organisms, including coral animals and plants and uh, sponges and a whole variety of biota. Um, and a healthy coral reef is coral dominated, dominated by the coral um, that makes the reef. Uh, but in uh, cases where corals are stressed by pollution, particularly uh, water quality issues, too many nutrients getting into the water and so forth, uh, combined with, cor uh, with climate change impacts um, and can be combined with uh, overfishing of certain important species on the reef, um, these coral reefs can shift from coral dominated to algal dominated. Algae grows all over the, the reef surface, um, basically smothering out the life of everything except the algae. Um, that's an alternative stable state, very difficult to revert back to the coral reef. Uh, so this is something we need to look out for, not just identifying problems and fixing the problems, but monitoring the system's health um, in every system that we have, where we know we have these uh, tipping points, where we know we have these thresholds. Um, if we see that we're moving towards those danger zones, uh, those tipping points, uh, we need to invest 
maximum amount of energy and attention to fixing the problems before we get to that alternative uh, stable state. So a second pathway to sustainability, uh, which I think is possible now, is um, to think and plan holistically. And by that, I mean, when we're trying to restore ocean health, we have to think about uh, what's led to the degradation, that problem scoping I just spoke about. Um, generally, this will mean that we aren't just focused on what's happening in the water, uh, but also focused on what's happening on land, um, what may be happening in the watershed, um, what, what rivers are bringing to the sea and so forth. Um, so when we think and plan holistically, it requires us to think big. It requires us to um, think in kind of system science, to understand these complex linkages, um, and to integrate our solution across all of these interconnected biomes. Um, including the humans that live um, in these interconnected biomes, of course, because it's going to be human behavior that we need to change in order to restore some of these ecosystems. So why is this possible now? Well, we have three decades of very good coastal management, integrated coastal management. So dealing with a lot of different uses and sectors um, in the coastal strip. Um, we have now about a decade or more of marine spatial planning that's been focused on the, the offshore areas, more from the coast going out to sea. Uh, and to date, we haven't seen really a linkage of these, these two realms very much, and nor have we seen marine spatial planning really focus on um, being harmonious with or influencing watershed management and land use in the coastal zone. So we've had all these kind of moving parts, progress towards uh, making the coasts better, healthier, uh, making the uh, offshore areas healthier, um, uh, making river systems healthier. But now we need to integrate all of these things together and think about how um, we might be addressing these issues in a holistic manner. It requires that we really fully consider land, fresh water, um, and the sea, and of course, the atmosphere, because um, many, many, um, in many areas, the, the atmospheric deposition of pollutants is what's driving water quality losses. So, uh, it's absolutely imperative that we think about all these interconnections and that we deal with them in an integrated and holistic way. Another third pathway to sustainability is to, is to introduce more long-termism, <laughs> to really think about the long-term impact um, of what we're doing and the long-term uh, viability of any restoration that we attempt. Um, so, and, to be thinking in this kind of long-term way requires that we think about how not just this kind of static health of a, of a system like the ocean health, but also to think about resilience. So to think about future disturbance, um, future cumulative threats that affect the ocean and think about ways to maximize um, the resilience of these systems so they can withstand these additional future pressures. Um, this kind of long-term thinking, uh, which not only is a, you know, is a function of kind of sophisticated system science and um, ability to uh, predict um, trends in condition, uh, but also uh, is, is in the domain of scenario science. So really telling stories of alternative plausible futures um, to be able to uh, think about the consequences of our action over the long term. Super important to do because it, it equips decision makers with an array of options um, from which they can understand trade-offs and choices. It's also super important because it prevents us from being surprised by the unintended consequences of certain actions. Um, now, we can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, and there's always going to be some surprises. 
But if we invest more of our um, knowledge and understanding towards thinking through the consequences of every action that we take, um, we'll be less apt to be surprised. Um, and perhaps in the in the question and answer, I can talk about some of these examples of um, unintended consequences that really um, surprised people and, and led to not the outcomes that they expected. So uh, having this long-term view in mind is super important and we have the tools and approaches to be able to do that um, and we need to use them to the maximum extent we can. We in restor ocean restoration now have a lot of experience too. So we not only have all these tools online and methods and approaches um, and conceptual frameworks and uh, all of the theory behind that, um, also supplied with uh, traditional knowledge and user knowledge, um, which kind of just enhances our ability to use these tools effectively. Um, we not only have all of this at our disposal but, disposal, but we have case studies. So we can learn from where the any one tool might work most effectively, uh, what we can learn from the pitfalls um, that, that projects face uh, in the rollout of restoration, um, and whether that's building, rebuilding uh, salt marsh as in the upper, left picture here in the Solent in the UK, or whether it's um, rebuilding uh, oyster reef and the middle picture, top picture in uh, Pensacola Bay in Florida, or whether that's um, establishing new seagrass in Abu Dhabi as the upper right picture, um, cleaning up and restoring uh, and physically rebuilding um, monk seal habitat uh, in the Mediterranean in the lower left, um, doing uh, macroalgae aquaculture, so seagrass, seaweed aquaculture, sorry, in Peru um, to improve the water quality of a bay um, and enhance the biodiversity that way. Or probably something you've heard a lot about is um, coral reef restoration and um, the, the initiatives that are going on all around the world to grow out corals in nursery areas. Um, then uh, improve the, the water quality conditions on the reef and then transplant these um, nursery corals back out onto the reef uh, when the conditions are better. So we have a lot of tools, methods. These are only a few. Uh, but as I say, we have now the practical experience of where the rubber hits the road and trying to do these restoration pro projects um, and seeing what works and what doesn't and what the conditions for success are. Um, and for this reason, we can now not only replicate uh, the, these successes, uh, but we can also come to scale with a lot of restoration that started out very small um, and is now moving towards large scale ocean restoration. But finally, the last pathway I want to talk about um, in the, my little pathways to ocean sustainability uh, is to find ways to really harness um, the incredible awareness that's been growing and um, what seems to be a kind of spirit of communalism or at least cooperation um, and something of a new ethos. And I think, uh, you know, that spirit of um, communalism is not prevalent in every society and every every society and every demographic, but it certainly is prevalent uh, among the young people of uh, much of the world. Um, and we have to find ways to strengthen that wave of awareness and, and ride it to a sustainable future. Um, and that means not only getting engaged with um, putting pressure on politicians to, to restore nature and to, to pay attention to ocean, health and so forth. Uh, but it also means um, personal individual behavior um, and doing whatever one can to, to live sustainably on the earth, um, maybe reducing consumption, um, maybe, um, maybe thinking about uh, different ways to um, 
vacation or to experience nature or um, maybe even to communicate through the arts and um, so forth to communicate the the importance of nature and ocean um, ocean as a part of nature um, but also very importantly um, strategies to achieve sustainability like Worcester College's um, sustainability strategy. Uh, I just want to do a shout out to Dr. Lisa Wedding, um, who invited me here uh, for this fellowship and with whom I'm working um, to address issues of large scale ocean restoration. Uh, but Lisa is in charge of um, sustainability for the college and um, this sustainability strategy um, has very concrete steps on how Worcester and the community of Worcester um, can move towards a more sustainable future. So I think all of this is possible. All of this is being done and we just need to ramp it up and, and keep the energy going. Um, it's going to be possible now, I think, to break this destructive cycle that we've had to date, this negative feedback loop and turn it on its head and turn it into a positive uh, for both the ocean and for humanity. So I thank you all for listening. Um, and I thank you for being aware of the momentum that's building and for being a part of it. And I also would like to thank David and Lisa um, and Worcester College for um, inviting me here and allowing me to share my thoughts. So thank you very much.